The power supply is typically the first section of the EFI harness design I consider. While it would be possible to begin with any of the five sections, the power supply section is the logical place to start, as it has the largest overlap with the other sections and can influence their design. The required fuses, relays and splicing typically make it the most complex section and it's best to get its design locked down at the beginning. The design of the power supply section requires us to determine which parts of the system require 12 volt power and when they should receive it. We implement the design by having a number of relays connected to the battery. The electromagnetic coils of those relays are then independently controlled to supply power to the parts of the system that currently need it. To design the power supply section of our wiring harness, we first need to list any parts fitted to the vehicle that require a 12 volt power supply. This will almost always include the ECU, ignition coils, fuel injectors, fuel pump and cooling fans. But it may include other devices such as O2 sensor heaters, external loggers or dash displays. On occasion you will also come across some sensors that require a 12 volt power supply such as an airflow meter or a wideband O2 sensor controller. It's important to note that we don't include in this section any sensors which are solely powered by a regulated supply from the ECU. These are considered separately in the sensors section of the design process. For each item in the EFI system we've identified as needing power, we now need to determine when that power is actually required and what controls when it is supplied. This step tends to naturally group the powered parts of the system into sections, which then determines the number of individual relays that we need. A common setup will have two driver controlled power stages. The first provides power to the ECU, dash display, loggers and any other parts we might want to communicate with or reprogram while the engine is not running. This is commonly referred to as main power. A second stage is used to supply power to the actuators required for the engine to actually run. Typically ignition coils and fuel injectors. This is commonly referred to as enable power. Splitting the driver controlled power supply like this allows for the engine to be stopped but the ECU and displays to remain active for download and examining logs or keeping an eye on heat soak for example. Other parts of our EFI system such as the fuel pump and radiator cooling fans will require their power supply to be controlled by the ECU. For each part of the EFI system that requires its power supply to be switched on and off independent of other parts of the system we need a separate relay. As an example a fairly common installation will have four power supply relays a main power relay which supplies power to the ECU and dash displays and an enable power relay which supplies power to the fuel injectors and ignition coils. These are both controlled by the driver either from the existing key barrel switch in the car or a switch panel which has been fitted to the interior. The other two relays are controlled by the ECU, one supplying power to the fuel pump and the other supplying power to a radiator cooling fan. One of the most important factors of our wiring harness power supply design is the size of the wires providing power to each component. There is a lot of opportunity for error here, the results of which can be pretty catastrophic, so we need to be careful and logical in our approach. We need to ensure that the wire we have supplying power to each device is capable of doing so without overheating, as this can melt the insulation around the wire leading to a fire. We do this by looking at each powered component individually and working out the amount of current that it will draw. As discussed in the electrical fundamentals section of the course, we can determine this using Ohm's law or the power equation depending on the information that we have access to. Once we know the current the device is going to draw, we can determine the size of the wire we need to run to it. It's typical to use a smaller size of wire that will safely handle the current level as this is cheaper and reduces both the bulk and the weight of the loom. However, like many things in the automotive world, the story is not quite that simple. We also need to take into account of where we splice one power supply wire out to different electronic components. If we look at the fuel injectors for example, we might run a single wire from the supply relay to a location close to our injectors, where we then splice and branch it out to each individual injector. In an instance like this, the section of wire before the splice is carrying the current of all the injectors, so it will most likely need to be a larger size than the individual wires to each injector after the splice. Attached below this module is a worksheet showing different wire sizes in American wire gauge and their current handling capability. We've also included a crossover to the closest metric unit equivalent, as although AWG is a more prevalent unit when you are purchasing wire, you're likely to strike the metric units, millimeters squared, sooner or later. In particular, OEM documentation for Japanese vehicles will denote the size of the wires in metric units. 
As a quick demonstration of how critical correct wire sizing is, we'll show you what happens when a wire is undersized. We have a simple setup here, it's a switch controlling a relay which is supplying power to a load, two halogen headlight bulbs in this instance. As the bulbs have a rated power consumption of 55 watts and we're powering them from a common car battery, we know they will draw approximately 4 amps each, for a total current draw of 8 amps. We're supplying power to the bulbs here using a 22 AWG wire, which we have purposely undersized. You can see that when we turn the switch on, the copper wire quickly heats up and the insulation begins to melt and burn. For this demonstration we have exaggerated the effect, but even a marginally undersized wire which is bundled tightly in a wiring harness can cause damage. If the wire is in the middle of the harness, it can't radiate any of its heat away directly to the atmosphere. The entire harness may also be subject to external heat sources in the engine bay, further compounding the problem. You can also imagine that if a wire in the middle of a harness overheats, the damage will not be limited to that single wire itself. While it is essential to calculate the current draw of the EFI system components and ensure the wiring is sized adequately, for a modified streetcar wiring harness using TXL wire, I do have some common rules of thumb to get things in the ballpark initially. I supply power and ground connections to ignition coils using 18 AWG wire and to injectors using 22 AWG wire. Almost all sensors and switches are powered, grounded and signal wires run using 22 AWG wire. High current loads such as fuel pumps and cooling fans use 14 AWG wire. These values all need to be double checked, but they provide a good starting point. Much like we determined how many relays our EFI power supply system requires by breaking the design down into sections defined by when they were to be powered, we determine the number of fuses the power supply system requires by further breaking down these sections into what we refer to as circuits. Each circuit requires a fuse, which is put in place to act as a safeguard in case something goes wrong with that particular circuit. As the fuses are only there in case of a problem, they must be sized to not interfere with the EFI system's normal operation. I size fuses so they will fail at around 150% of the largest current we would expect to see in the circuit they're protecting. This might sound slightly dangerous, as it's possible we've sized our wiring to handle a current below this level, However, in the instance that something goes wrong, it takes appreciable time for the wire to heat up to a point where it will be dangerous, and the fuse will have failed long before this happens. A good example of fusing can be illustrated using fuel injectors. Our enable power relay will supply power to both the injectors and the ignition coils. We would break the supply out to two individual fuses, one for the injector supply circuit and one for the ignition coil supply circuit. If we look at an engine with four injectors, each drawing 2 amps, we could expect the injector circuit to draw a maximum total current of 8 amps. The optimal fuse size for this circuit would be 1.5 times this current draw, giving us a fuse size of 12 amps. The next largest size of commonly available automotive blade fuse is 15 amps, so that would be our choice to protect the injector supply circuit. Breaking the power supply from the relay down into individual circuits like this is also very useful when it comes time to troubleshoot a problem, as if the injector circuit fuse is constantly blowing, we know exactly where to look for our problem. Depending on the specification of the EFI system you're building a wiring harness for, you may need to incorporate a feature known as ECU hold power. This feature allows for the driver to control when the ECU initially receives power, but lets the ECU determine when to remove its own power supply and turn off. This feature is used in setups where the ECU may need some time to perform functions before it turns off, such as parking an idle control valve in a known position. If this function is required, your ECU documentation will have specific instructions on how it should be wired. An important issue to be aware of when designing the power supply scheme is that of ECU backfeeding. Because of the way ECUs are constructed internally, it's sometimes possible for them to connect their output channels to ground when the power supply to the ECU is removed. This can cause problems for actuators connected on one side to 12 volt power and an ECU output channel on the other. If the power supply to the ECU is then removed, and the power supply to the actuator is not, the ECU may now unintentionally provide a ground for the actuator, turning it on. Particularly in the case of fuel injectors or ignition coils, this may be a dangerous or damaging situation. Luckily, the solution to this problem is an easy one, and we overcome the issue by having the same relay that supplies power to our ECU also supply power to the low current switching coils of the other relays in the system. 
This way, if the relay providing power to the ECU is switched off, it's guaranteed that the relays providing power to the system actuators are also switched off. That was just one of the 65 modules from our EFI Wiring Fundamentals course, which is the perfect place to start if you're interested in learning how to design and build EFI wiring harnesses. This course will teach you the fundamental electrical principles that you'll need to know, how to select the correct materials to ensure they can withstand the automotive environment, the wiring requirements of different sensors and actuators, and how to design a power supply and grounding scheme that will protect the harness in the case of a component failure. You'll learn how to correctly splice and insulate connections, how to bundle a harness and then sheath it to keep it tidy and protected. For more information and to purchase the course, click the link now.